Hey guys, welcome to the Disruptors, the podcast where we get the folks who are quite literally disrupting and transforming the future and how we think about it. Today, we've definitely got one of them, Jason Prawl. Jason, thanks for coming today. Hey, thanks for having me. Sorry if you can hear some uh, lawn care going on in the background, but uh, apparently it's lawn maintenance day here in San Diego. Oh, aren't you guys under a drought? You're going through a huge forest fire at this point, right? Yeah, it's a little more north of us, but yeah, it's, it's always a drought down here. It hardly ever rains. Yeah, it never rains. Climate change. I, we'll probably jump into that in a little bit, but I got you on the program because of the Human Longevity Project. Tell me what you've been working on and why it's awesome. Yeah, last year we, we put out a documentary film series called The Human Longevity Project where we run around the world to, uh, to meet and chat with people in their 90s and 100s to get a sense for really what was contributing to their health in old age. Um, there's been some research done in this area, but you know, from my perspective as a, as a health practitioner and, and really looking into what I feel is causing problems for people in, in the U.S., I think a, a lot of pieces were missed uh, in the previous works, and particularly in the scientific research world, they don't really look at, at the lifestyle factors that are really contributing to health as we age. So that, that was really what we set out to do is not really explore areas because I don't really feel like it's an area or a location that is so special, but rather the, the culture and the habits that are preserved in, in very specific areas because there is sort of underlying fundamental themes that tend to contribute to health as we age. What would you say are the most important themes? I mean, there's, there's so many, right? I think when we look at the, the longevity areas around the world where we tend to see people living into their 90s and 100s fairly successfully, you know, we see a much simpler life. I mean, I think that's really the, the, the core factor that I think we can look at. Um, and then from there springs out a number uh, of factors that, that contribute to health, you know, namely simplicity of food, growing your own food in and around you, uh, growing up in a social fabric that is conducive to health and well-being, right? This includes connection and meaning in life and a, a common shared uh, sense of values, um, close-knit families, um, and just a sense that, that, that the world is not out to get them, right? They, there's not this competing, um, this, this fear-based mentality about the world, you know? And, and I don't think we perceive it that way in the US. We think we're just kind of doing our thing. But if you really stop and think about it, we are constantly chasing things. We, you know, we, we have to succeed. We have to make money. We've got to buy this. We've got to keep up with that. And a lot of this complexity that we've created in our life, as wonderful as it is and as fun as it is, is damaging our health in a number of ways if we really look at what's, what's creating these things. It's basically saying, are we kind of screwed? We're in the cities. We're not farming for ourselves and we're all super busy. I think if we don't have the right philosophy and we don't have um, our eye on the prize, so to speak, in other words, what are we here to do? What are we, what's the point of life, right? Is it to progress? Is it to keep moving forward technologically speaking? Is it to keep making more money? Is it to, uh, you know, what is it? What is it we're here to do? And if we don't have uh, the proper philosophy, the proper understanding, the proper framework set forth, then yeah, we are screwed. You know, because these technologies, the things that we're doing in life right now are, are getting so complex, so fast, so um, dangerous if, if we use them the wrong way that we're gonna, it's going to lead us to our own peril. However, if we sort of about face a little bit and, and reframe what we're here to do, what the point of all this is, then I think these technologies, these advancements that we're making in the modern world can be the things that actually save us. So, you know, we're just developing sharper and sharper swords. You know, we just have to figure out how to use them properly for, for the means, you know, to, to get to, to where we're going to go, right? That's really the key. And if we don't know where we want to go, then we're just going to keep following this path, you know, basically blind and hopefully it ends well. That's kind of what I see right now. And, and, and fortunately, we, we are having more of these conversations, you know, your podcast and a lot of other people that are out there talking about what can we do to change the course that we're on? Um, I think this is starting to really create a wave uh, that's ultimately going to end up in a, in a good place. I think that's, I'm, I'm more of an optimist than anything, but I think we also have to, to play the game a little bit. We can't sit back idly and just keep waiting for the next iPhone to come out and um, think that, that we're all going to be saved. Yeah, it's hard because individuals can be intelligent, but collective groups are always dumber is generally speaking <laughs> right. how it plays out. That's why we have mob mentality. Right. You, definitely, you definitely see that happening. So yeah, absolutely. A big part of the reason I wanted to get you on is there's a couple of different schools of thought. And I think the schools of thought do a terrible job of working with each other and could do much better. You've got your Western medicine, your Eastern medicine, your functional medicine, and now your exponential tech medicine. 
I would yeah. kind of categorize them roughly in those four. How do, how do these break out in terms of the film, what you guys have researched or found, and then where you think we ought to be headed? Yeah, and that's a perfect question because that's that's really the the realm in which I had been working for the last few years, which is in this sort of integrative functional medicine type of model. And while it can be used fairly successfully to mitigate or you know uh, halt disease in a in a in a decent way, it's not really there to teach health. You know, it, it it's just not. Um, this is what society does. This is what families do. This is what education does if it's done the right way. It teaches us how to live, right? If we go to the art of living or Ayurveda, the science of life, right? Those are the sort of frameworks that I think are more appropriate if we want to look at, um, at where we want to go, you know, and the places that we went, you know, in, in the mountains of Sardinia and the island of Icaria, and these places have been known for, for their longevity and they're perfect places because they don't have advanced systems of medicine. They don't have integrative medicine. They don't have functional medicine. They don't have Western medicine. They don't have any of this stuff. And yet they live long, healthy lives. Um, it's not to say that that people don't die early in some instances, especially in the past before electricity, but they also, because of that, really appreciated what they needed to do, right? We we sort of have this casual mindset thinking that we can have integrated functional Western or, you know, whatever kind of medicine come and save us, you know, when, when something goes wrong. And that can kind of lead to destructive behavior long term. So, you know, really where we want to go. I think is outside of the medical frameworks that have been created. It doesn't mean they don't have a place, um, but they really should be reserved for that point where, you know, lifestyle interventions are sort of not good enough. You know, that that they're, they're so far beyond this this place of of recovery with health and and wellness that we actually have to come in with a medical intervention. So you know, I think it's just going back to the basics, and you know, it's not sexy. It doesn't have a huge business model behind it. But at the end of the day, it's probably one of the best investments you can make individually and for your family, let alone with the, with the local community and the, and the greater whole, um, you know, as we move forward. The big problem is the health insurance system. Right now, you're not with a health insurer for life. There's not a single payer system and the incentives are broken because you have three different parties. So I might be with Blue Cross Blue Shield this year and with Aetna the next year. Well, Blue Cross isn't incentivized to help me live longer if I'm not going to be a customer the whole time. How do we fix that conundrum? Yeah, and this is a funny one, right? This has um, definitely become a political hot button as of late. You know, people pushing for uh, healthcare for all and all these type of things. And while on the surface that sounds maybe like a good idea, it's really not what we want. You know, I think I know think people think that that's what we want, but it, it's really not um, because because of the things you're describing. The model is completely broken. There's too many players in the game, right? You you don't need multiple parties to go buy a pair of shoes. You don't need multiple parties to even get uh, Botox or, you know, breast augmentation, right? Those things are basically peer to peer. They are, they are between two parties and you execute them and the efficiencies, the productivity, the, uh, the, the capitalistic nature of that has, has been such that that has improved as well as the cost coming down over time. So right there, we can see that even in a sort of medical model, we don't necessarily need a third party system, let alone a governmental system that clearly is non-efficient, you know, if we look at the greater whole and what they do. Um, so it, it's, we really have to sort of reframe our thinking in this regard. Um, just like with, you know, auto insurance, you know, we, we, we have auto insurance and it can be used uh, effectively, but you know, when you get a flat tire or you get a, a broken windshield or, you know, you need to change your oil, you don't call your auto insurance company and, and go through that system. It would be massively inefficient. It would increase costs. It would slow things down. Um, it's just unnecessary. So when it comes to health, we, we should be building in some things for the unknown. We should have catastrophic health insurance. That can be very beneficial, just like if your house burns down or you get into an auto accident. But when it comes to, you know, going back to a car analogy, maintaining your car on a regular basis, changing the oil, right, changing the filters, doing the basic things that, that you would do to make sure the car is up and running is the best thing you can do and learning how to drive the car safely. And I would also argue driving less often would probably be the most beneficial things you could do to avoid accidents and, and wear and tear. So this applies to our lives as well. We need to look at the things. How can we slow things down? How can we slow the progression of disease down? How can we just stop a little bit? You know, how can we slow down uh, everything about our lives? And then how do we build in practices to mitigate these, these likely events as we get older, knowing that, of course, things will happen. 
and there is a place for insurance and there is a place for medical doctors, uh, particularly, you know, catastrophic care. But the way that we're looking at health insurance now and the health system now, I think is, is completely flawed. And if we look around the world, it's just not done uh, the way we're doing it in most places. And especially if you look at indigenous cultures and cultures that we, we visited in Costa Rica and Ikaria and Okinawa, they don't, they don't have the same mindset. They don't have the same framework. So they, they practice health as much as they can, particularly in the past hundred years. And this has led to good health as they age. So I want to push back on one thing that you said in terms of a governmental healthcare system not being the answer. Is the problem with governmental healthcare the fact that it's inherently expensive, or is it that the U.S. government is inherently inefficient? Because they do a really good job in other countries. Now, I would say we would both agree on the fact that we need to f- combine Western medicine with functional medicine, and these things need to be covered by a health insurance plan because you want to have prevention and then uh, protection when something goes wrong. You want to be able to fix the problem, but also avoid the problem. Right. But do you not think that? Do you not think? I think about an analogy for driving would be, but we have laws in terms of seat belts, in terms of emissions, in terms of bumper lights, et cetera. If we didn't have those laws in place, people aren't incentivized to do this themselves because it may not cost them. It may cost someone else. Do we need to have those regulations? Like for instance, I I lived in Switzerland for a while. My wife is Swiss. And when I needed to buy health insurance, it took five minutes. I could see the numbers and I knew that none of the companies were screwing me because there were a ton of rules in place in terms of what had to be included. Right, right. And so just, so there's a lot there, right? Uh, and I would argue that yes, government is inherently inefficient, uh, at least in the US, the way we have it set up. Now, we are 400 million people in the US, right? We are sort of non-homogenous in a way, right? So all these factors definitely come into play. We have different states with different rights and different you know, things going on there. So there's a lot at play here. We also have an aging population, so we have to consider that. But ultimately, I think we have to just get down to the fact that it's not necessary to have government healthcare. Now, we can have it, and it may not, it's, I'm not saying it's not a, a good idea in, in practice or in theory, but it's not necessary. You know, and I can prove that to you just by going around the world. There's plenty of places that don't have any healthcare at all, and they're, they're healthier than we are, and they're happier than we are. Again, it doesn't mean we can't have it or we shouldn't maybe strive for that. Um, I think it can be put in place, but we have to look at the incentive structures that are, that are there. And when you have multiple parties competing and multiple incentives in place, it's going to get messy real quick. And so, you know, you, you really can't have good quality healthcare, cheap healthcare, and universal healthcare. That's kind of impossible. You cannot have all three. You generally have to have two of the three, right? When you have this insurance matrix in place. So if, if you want quality, you're going to have to either give up price, right? So you either pay more or you have to wait, right? You can't have, I mean, this is sort of capitalism 101, right? It, it, sort of demand and, and supply working against each other, right? So if there's a system that we can set up that, that can create all three high quality, so the incentive for quality, so where's the incentive for quality come in, right? Where does the incentive for lowering prices come in? And then where does the incentive for efficient, effective, and quick, right? The, the, the quickness of this healthcare, the availability of it. If you can create an incentive structure that has all three, I'm all for it, but I haven't heard of one yet. And I, I don't know that that's possible. I would say all the highest rated healthcare systems in the world have it. Like Switzerland, for instance, they're definitely, they're number one or number two and they have that, but that's a, it's kind of a moot point. It's, it's something that the U S will take a long time to come around to because it was built incorrectly from the ground up in terms of, in terms of health though, not just healthcare and fixing people or sick care, but in terms of living longer and slowing aging, what are some of the what are some of the unexpected findings you guys had from the both uh, the project where you went around the world talking with centenarians and well let's just say very old people and the experts that you guys brought in to consult? Yeah, and and this is an important factor because you know again sort of we got you know off on a tangent a little bit about healthcare. Healthcare doesn't bring health. Does not bring health at all. There's no such thing as as healthcare delivering health. The only thing that can create health is inside the human body. So, you know, even with integrative and sort of more Eastern philosophies of health, all you're doing is allowing the body to create health within. This is where health comes from, it comes from within, it does not come from a system, it does not come from a doctor, it doesn't come from anywhere else other than from within. So really that's what we have to look at, you know, and, and around the world, there was a lot of things that, that came into play 
but I think a few of the things that, that came that, that surprised me a little bit was how the environment affects somebody's health and behavior. And here, here's what I mean by this. So I, I live in Carlsbad, which is north of San Diego. It's beautiful weather here almost all year round, right? I also know that walking is one of the most beneficial things I can do for my health, both mental, physical, and emotional health. So in theory, because I know that walking is good and the weather is good here, I should be walking all the time. And yet I don't, right? So, so what is that? Why is that the case? Um, and then on the other side, when I was in Tallinn, Estonia for about three weeks at a, at a conference, um, I walked all the time. So my knowledge didn't change. And yet my behavior changed drastically. I, I, I walked literally, I mean, I think I took a, uh, an Uber or cab that twice in three weeks. I walked everywhere else. And it was because the environment was conducive for my behavior to change. The environment that I was sort of staying in was conducive for me to walk around. And so I behaved totally differently. So this is, I think, what caught me off guard a little bit is that when we went to Costa Rica, for example, I noticed that I was so much more calm and serene, right? Their, their sort of slogan is Pura Vida, right? Pure life and just living this sort of pure life. And so when we were there, my behavior was very different. My mental behavior, my thought patterns, my emotional states, uh, my sense of time uh, changed. So this is what I think was a big takeaway for me was going to these places and recognizing that when you're in these places, um, you behave differently, you think differently, you feel differently, you, you operate completely differently. And so it really comes down to, you know, and a good example, this is New York City, right? If anybody's been to New York City, you go there and it's like things are moving quickly, right? You can't slow down and kind of take this nice, gentle stroll through, through downtown Manhattan, right? It's sort of the, the buzz is all around you. And in, in a way, it's electric. It feels cool. It's great. But on the other side, it, you have to realize the environment's changing you. It's dictating your behavior. So I think that was a big one. We talk now a lot about, um, sorry, this is really loud right here. Um, we talk now a lot about slowing down, right? And meditation and breath work and yoga and some of these things. And that's great to, to get into those practices. But if we look at our daily lives, we're still running a mile a minute. We feel like we're late for everything. We've got things popping up on our phones left and right. We've got emails to answer. It never stops, right? So the environment that we've really set up is not necessarily conducive toward a healthy long life. So I think that was a big one for me to sort of recognize in the moment in time when we were there. Um, I think the other one was the fact that it was taking historical context of, of the research, right? So a, a lot of the research that's done on these places looks at what they're doing today. And while that may be important, if you're talking to a hundred year old, you got to recognize that they were born in 18, 1918. So that means, and, and most of them didn't have electricity until 1960, 1970. So that means 50 years of their life, they lived without electricity. That means no refrigeration, no freezers, no transportation of goods as we know it today. They lived a complete, no, no lighting, no overhead lighting that we now know is disrupting circadian rhythm and causing all kinds of sleep issues. So they lived in a very different way. So just hearing those stories of the past and how they lived, you know, how they gave birth, um, how, they, how they raised children, um, how they grew food and, and all these things was very, very eye-opening to hear from people over and over again, because we don't have really the context to think about those things in our modern world. And it makes it really, really hard to do any type of health studies. You've got different blue zones essentially across the world. Two things that seem to be common, at least looking from the outside would be nice weather and lots of sex. Do you think that plays into the, it plays into the health cards? Um, I, I think it can. I think nice weather tends to facilitate more activity outside, uh, allows you to uh, grow foods. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it can. Now, can we live a long time in colder parts of the world? Probably, but it's gonna be a little bit more difficult, especially with technology the way it is now. Um, sex, 100%. I mean, this is a well-known healthy activity on a number of levels, but I think it's probably beyond just the actual physical sex component, because we have a lot of sex here in the US, but it's not the same right? It's, it's, it's more of the connection. It's more of the meaning. It's more of the, the love and, and compassion and everything that goes behind the sex that they're having there, which is that their communities, their, their groups are much more tightly knit. They're, they're connected. They, they have lifelong partnerships. Um, so it's, it's just a little bit different, I think, the way that they operate. And it's hard to really put into words until you go there and you see that they're all talking to each other. They're all connecting. They're all 
friend, they've been friends for a long time. They go and make a, a point just to meet up and talk, right? We don't, they don't need all these distractions that we have in our, in our modern world. So yeah, I, it, there's a lot of things that you can look at that say that, that suggest that there's similarities between the regions, but fundamentally, I think we all know what healthy living is if we just tune in a little bit because we can feel it. You know, we feel it when we feel good, right? When we're happy, when we are content, when we are satisfied, when we are in a state of compassion and, and connected to everybody around us. So there's, there's a lot of things that, that come into play that with regard to their, their similarities, but ultimately it's very basic, simple living. Most people don't associate emotions with internal biology. Can you break that down a little bit in terms of what you guys learned? I mean, this is, this is a huge one. This isn't something we actually dove into much with our, with our uh, film series because it's almost like cancer, right? If I were to talk to a lot of them about cancer, which I kind of did sometimes, they kind of looked at me like, no, it doesn't exist. You know, it's, it's not something that we have. Or sleep issues, right? I'd say, you know, anybody have trouble sleeping? They look at me like I'm crazy, right? Or digestive issues. So when something's not a problem, it's almost like it's not even in their purview. It's not in their psyche. So something like emotional issues, emotional traumas, et cetera, wasn't really a big factor for them. So they, they really couldn't comment on it, so to speak. But in our Western world, it's a huge problem. And I would argue that it's the most important problem that we have to address, which is again, why something like uh, healthcare systems aren't really designed to, to address this type of stuff. You know, if you look at the work of Carl Jung, um, Ken Wilber, uh, even Freud, there's a lot of, of things that we can learn from these things, from these, their, their work that suggests that we have so much trauma coming in from childhood um, and even, even that we can inherit from our parents or grandparents. This is now shown in the science as well. So we're, we're taking on this massive burden, particularly in the West, of emotional traumas because of splitting of the household, um, parenting not necessarily done in a way that is conducive for healthy uh, development of the psyche. Um, this is showing up later in life uh, for, for almost all of us in some fashion. Um, and this is contributing to autoimmune diseases, cancers, heart disease, you name it, diabetes. This, this emotional trauma shifts our nervous system to act from a place of security, safety, uh, because of fear, right? So something that was not, some need that was not getting met in our developmental stages, usually between conception and about five or seven years old, that then creates this personality, right? And we all have these personalities that we think is, are us, and the personalities are not us. They are simply mechanisms and uh, responses from an early childhood that, that were needed to satisfy some, something that was not getting addressed, right? Some need that we were getting, not getting as children that caused us to behave a certain way, right? You see this a lot with successful people, that they need to succeed in order to get the love and, and adoration and, and attention that they didn't get when they were kids. So this manifests in so many ways. We have the sabotage, the self-sabotage as aspect of it. We have people turning inward and keeping their feelings inside, not really exposing themselves because every time they did when they were three or, or two, that their, their mom or dad sort of suppressed it. And there's all kinds of our personalities that, that come from this. And this shifts our nervous system. Um, we have basically two aspects of our nervous system, right? The sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The sympathetic is our fight or flight, which is it's typically referred to. The parasympathetic is the rest, digest, repair, et cetera. So that is where health is sort of regained or recharged is in this repair aspect of the nervous system. Typically happens when we sleep, um, but you know, as long as we're not in sympathetic overdrive through, throughout the day, then we have a chance to sort of maintain health. Most of us are so shunted over to the sympathetic side of, of the nervous system that it is nothing but destruction, essentially. This is where everything sort of breaks down. And over time, that will be so great that, that we can't repair and recover as fast as we need to, and thus disease takes hold. Um, and you see this, this model show up in all kinds of uh, Eastern philosophies, in Ayurveda, in Chinese medicine, in indigenous cultures. It's, it's all over the place. But we just don't seem to really want to grasp it here. And again, there's, there's, very, uh, there's a ton of work done by Kel Ken Wilber. He's probably one of the, the experts I would refer to most on this aspect. Um, the traumas really are a fundamental component to uh, our disease processes that we're seeing today. And it's not that they, they, that they cause these things individually. They are one component. And I would, I would argue that they're the base component of our diseases. And then we throw on all the other things in, in our lifestyle that, that add on to that fact. 
I would argue about the traumas being the base component because I, I find it very hard to believe that there wouldn't be trauma in the blue zones and it would just be so much worse in Western culture. I would, I would guess it's much more of a, there are issues, but it's the body's ability to heal. So stress and then mitochondrial adaptation and basically the efficiency of your body to deal with what's coming in. That yeah, makes, but that's, yeah, that's, that the, that's the problem. Yeah, that's the problem is that stress is, there's no such, I mean, the way we define stress, we have to clarify that a little bit because we have stressors, right? The things that, that initiate a stress response, but then we have our ability to handle stress, right? And that's what we don't have. We don't have the ability to handle stress as well because we are, we have the emotional traumas running in the background. It's like a, it's like a, a program running in the background of your computer. It's just, it's not going to be as efficient. So th this, if you have proper development, most traumas occur between conception and four or five years old. So if you have proper childhood development, like you see in these, in these sort of blue zones or areas where people are healthy, they have a way to develop these children much better than we do. We have so many kids now that have so many developmental traumas. And, and these, are, these are simple things. I mean, just take, for example, breastfeeding, right? We, we can look at breastfeeding um, from a biomechanical standpoint, um, or we can look at it from an, a, an emotional attachment standpoint. If a child is not breastfed for two years, then there is very likely going to be attachment issues that can come from that. If, if breastfeeding stops at four months, 100%, you're going to see childhood trauma develop in that, in that child. So this is, again, it's well known, it's, it's well published, and, and this trauma stuff is bigger than people recognize. And I can tell you this because every person that I've gotten that has come into my uh, practice that I've, I've worked with has trauma. And they've seen all kinds of functional medicine doctors. They've seen uh, naturopaths. They've seen chiropractors, acupuncturists, you name it. And the, and the reason that they can't get better is because the fundamental component, which is the trauma, is putting their nervous system in a state that it cannot succeed. So no matter what you do, the nervous system is guiding the whole process. So if you don't have good vagus nerve function, if you don't have good, ha have good central nervous system function, you don't have good enteric nervous system function, then no matter what we throw at it in terms of supplements, in terms of lifestyle changes, that, that disruption is always ongoing in the subconscious mind. So it is a core factor. And I can only say this because I've worked with it so many times that it's not a matter of fixing the diet and getting more exercise and changing the lifestyle. That is huge. And it, we need to do that as well because those could be added stressors to the load. But the fundamental characteristic is, is that trauma. And you just don't see that in these blue zones. They have a proper developmental function for children because they're growing up in the household, because they have mom and dad nearby typically, because they have constant care, breastfeeding, et cetera, that that is not as much of an issue that we, as we see here in the West. How much of that is self-selection though? People are, that are coming to you already have the trauma and they're able to recognize trauma based off of what, get, it's the same thing with psychologists. People recognize things whether or not they happened because they're looking for that versus I'm going to bet that just about everyone went through some type of traumatic event. Yep. The question That's isn't true. whether or not they went through it. The question is how they came out the other end and did it negatively imprint itself on them? Yeah. And I would, and here's the thing. So when we have these traumas, what we do is we develop adaptations to them, right? These, these mechanisms of personality that, that protect us. Right. And, and that is undoubtedly you're correct that I think everybody comes, grows up with this stuff. The key is, can we get to the resolution and how bad is it in that, in that early childhood? If somebody was sexually abused at two years old, they're probably not going to have a memory of it that's conscious, and it's still going to massively affect them such that they have to get some sort of therapies. And this can absolutely manifest in, in autoimmune disease and, and these are various other diseases. In fact, Kaiser Permanente, along with the CDC, did this work called the ACEs study uh, a number of years ago that, that showed this, that, that heart disease, that autoimmune disease, that cancers all skyrocket with people that have these emotional traumas in, in, in children. And ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Events Study. So that is, it's been well documented, well published. The key is, is that the people that come to me, they're not coming to me because they have emotional trauma. They're coming to me because they have an autoimmune disease. They're coming to me because they have digestive issues. They're coming to me because their hair's falling out or they have uh, hormonal imbalances. They can't get pregnant, whatever it is. That's why they're coming to me. And as I do the evaluation, yes, there's, there's lifestyle factors that we need to look at. There are toxins that, that are in their environment that, you know, from household products, and et cetera. There are sleep issues. There are biochemical imbalances that we can address. There are things like this for sure. But as I dig deeper and I start to ask them, 
I'm always uncovering these, these childhood traumas and they, and they didn't recognize it. They didn't know it was there. And there's a number of techniques that can be used to sort of uh, map this and to recover from this. You know, things like neural feedback, it it can be used. I would, it's not generally the most successful. Um, EMDR is a very good one. Um, You know, tapping or EFT, emotional freedom technique is very common and uh, used thing. Uh, Hypnotherapy, I love hypnotherapy. I think that's a very successful tool. Um, There's a number of things like this that that can be used. Um, But, but ultimately, those are the things that when they get resolved, everything else becomes easier. Because those are the things that are guiding your behavior, your thought processes, your emotions, right? So we have, I don't know how many thousands of thoughts per day that are popping into our head. Just if you watch people, you'll see certain people that have this, this bias, this tendency towards this sort of negative view on the world, right? This sort of lens that they look through is so negative. They're always seeking the danger and the fear. That's coming from a childhood uh, response. That's an adaptation to a childhood trauma. So this is always ongoing in, in people, and we have to recognize what that is for us. And so as we get resolution to those traumas, then the nervous system changes, the thoughts change, the emotions change. And now why this person is eating such and such or doing such and such that they know is sort of harmful to them, now they can change. But without that, that shift in the subconscious, that, that change and that resolution of the trauma, it's very, very difficult, almost impossible to get these changes. In fact, that's what the ACEs study, that's how it was born. It was, I think they were doing a weight loss study or something to that effect. And they, they, there was a certain portion of the, of the study group that wasn't able to complete the study. And so they asked them, they were trying to figure out why they were unable to even complete the study. And what they found was that there was emotional traumas in fairly high numbers that created a behavioral shift to these people so that these people couldn't even follow the study. So, and it doesn't have to be things like, you know, smoking and drinking and drug abuse. It's, it can be very simple things like overwork, right? Somebody that's so successful that they're overworked. I mean, Steve Jobs is a fantastic example of this, right? I mean, that guy, there's a number of things written on his personality and, and what have you. Unbelievable guy changed the world, but clearly there was some stuff going on and he died of cancer in a very early age. And I know people like to speculate as to why he died of cancer, but if you just look at the big picture, and of course there's a number of factors, um, but if you look at the big picture, I can guarantee you there was, there was childhood trauma that created this personality that became Steve Jobs. So we can see this over and over again, and it, 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 it results in a number of different personality traits, um, and not all of them are, are, that we would classify as bad. It's just out of balance. It's, it's not a homeostatic sort of central control that is balanced in a way that can lead us to health long term. How do you think about the psilocybin and uh, psychedelics movement that seems to be getting some steam? I love it. I absolutely love it. And this is actually one of the things that can be used um, effectively to get some resolution or shift happening with somebody that has trauma. I've seen it a number of times personally. Uh, In fact, I work with it. Um, Mushrooms in particular, psilocybin mushrooms, um, are very, very good. In fact, there's a number of studies looking at how it can improve depression and anxiety. Um, and there's reasons for that. You know, psilocybin shuts down the default mode network of the brain, reduces blood flow to that part of the brain, which is essentially our, the sense of self, right? Our ego, if you will, sort of reduces the function of that part of the brain while stimulating other parts of the brain. And this can activate and bring to the surface some of these traumas, some of these emotions that are caught up in our body. And that's the other thing that people don't recognize. The emotions actually get trapped in the body. We think of them as something that's affecting the mind only. It's not correct. It's act, they can be stored in the body. So a lot of the functional issues that we have in our body um, you can find emotional issues that are that are residing there. In fact, Chinese medicine looks at this a lot. You know, something like the liver. Liver is known to store anger and bitterness and these type of things. So, there's lots of research and, and documented uh, uh, writings on this stuff. Uh, but things like psilocybin, MDMA has been looked at for um, PTSD and a number of other you know psychological uh, imbalances and issues there. Um, you know, I've seen ayahuasca work tremendously well for all kinds of traumas, pulling up and allowing things to come to the surface that people didn't know were there, you know, child abuse and sexual abuse at early, early ages, people can sort of see or witness or experience that again and allow it to, to sort of leave them. So, so kind of what, whatever comes up for them is sort of leaving their psyche, leaving their, their nervous system. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a tremendous, uh, tool that we can use if done in the right way. I do think that they can be used as a crutch or a bypass as well. So you have to be careful with, with this, this aspect of things. You can't just pretend to you know, take a bunch of mushrooms and think you're going to get fixed, right? It's not how it works. You know, a lot of this has to be in, done in a ceremonial way or at least an intentional way um, with 
hopefully proper care taking place that somebody that's there watching or guiding the process for you, whether it's a shaman or whether it's, you know, somebody in the new medical uh, studies that are being done by places like maps and others. Um, that's the way it should be used. I think it has to be used effectively with the right intention going in. You know, they always say set and setting. I, I do think that is critical for, for the use of these type of things. But, but I, I don't even like the word psychedelic, to be honest. Um, I think there are psychedelics, um, which I would classify as sort of LSD and, and ketamine and some of these other sort of chemical manufactured um, medicines or psychedelics. But to me, something like medicinal mushrooms or ayahuasca or iboga, which is now used for all kinds of, of uh, drug addictions. I think those are more plant medicines. Um, and I say that because they are natural. They are not chemically derived or altered. Um, they're naturally growing. And there does seem to be a little bit difference in how they effectively um, impact the, the human psyche and the human body. It, it, you know, There's a, a medicine called yahe that's done in the Colombian tradition. And this thing is a pur purgative. It's you purge, you have diarrhea, you vomit, and it is more of a body. Uh, it affects the body more so than I would say the, the, the mind or the psyche. Um, and so they work in different ways. And these ancient uh, cultures and these, these traditions know how to use them effectively. I think we need to start to gain some of that knowledge and wisdom on how to use these effectively and what they're really there for um, and, and hopefully how they work so that we can be more proactive and not create more disturbances with, with, the, with the use of these things. But I'm a huge supporter of, of the movement to increase the study of these things and, and the, the responsible use of these things. That makes two of us. It, it has so much promise for healing all sorts of, of trauma and issues. I, I agree that trauma is problems. We can disagree to the, to the extent, I think, to some Fair extent, enough. if you if you overly acknowledge something, it al you almost become powerless to try to change it. It's like the excuse, the crutches. But in terms of in terms of health, we have plant based medicines. But I mean, we have food medicine, and people don't right. think about food as medicine, which I think would be a massive problem you guys unearthed in in making this. Yeah, I mean, there's so many problems with the food supply right now. This is this is such a loaded topic, right? I mean, man, between the paleo diet and the carnivore diet and the vegetarian vegan communities and the FODMAPs and the on and on, there's a lot of frameworks out there to look at. But putting all of that aside, I will say that the thing that, that we need to focus on most is growing good, healthy food, quality food in healthy soil. The, the, the plants cannot be medicinal if the soil is deficient and, and not healthy. This is fundamental. The, the soil has to have enough organisms, enough biological activity in it to, so that the plant that's growing there has to create the defenses to protect itself, right? So hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully, so what I'm setting up here is the soil needs to be a quote unquote dangerous place for the plant such that it now has to create these phytochemicals and polyphenols and these compounds that we think of as, as healthy and beneficial and medicinal. The soil has to be sort of a, a, enough of a playground for those things to need to develop. If you have this, this soil that's sort of dead, that, that is, there's nothing going on there, then the plant doesn't need to develop these phytochemicals. It doesn't need to develop the, the plant defenses. The plant defenses are the things that we use primarily as, as medicine, right? So when you think about garlic or onion or mint or basil, uh, any of these sort of things, the compounds that we're, we're, we're looking at here that are so valuable come from the need for that plant to defend itself. So what we have right now is just totally deficient soils. They, they don't have the minerals that, that can be taken up. They don't have the, 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 the bioactivity in place for the plant to thrive. So we basically steal the immune system of the plant, if you will, while, while, by consuming these things. So to me, this is the most, th the, the most beneficial thing that we need to uh, look at when it comes to food as medicine. Um, a lot of the foods that we have out there are just not as medicinal as they were 100 years ago or that they were growing in some of these regions that we looked at. You know, these things are growing wild. They're growing in backyard gardens that are pretty damn wild. I mean, they're not like these beautiful gardens that we construct here in the U.S. So you know, I think there's, there's a lot to look at there, but I absolutely do agree that we need to go back to using food as a, as a medicine and understand how to use it effectively. You know, buying the, the apple chips, the organic apple chips in a bag at Whole Foods is not the same as, as picking a wild apple and eating it right off the tree. Sorry, not even close. 
right? You have organisms on the skin of the apple and that's in the wild. You have the water that's still in the apple, which we know structured water uh, is massively beneficial for our health. We have a, such a different live living thing that we're eating versus this dead apple chip that's quote unquote organic that may or may not have pesticides in it that has been processed six ways to Sunday end up in a bag. So, you know, we, we have to really get back to the fundamentals. And that's why at the beginning I said simplicity is the key. You know, it's so much more simple to go outside and pick blackberries off a, off, off a bush, in, you know, as you're, as you're hiking down a trail than it is to, you know, go buy some in a grocery store. Uh, it doesn't seem more simple, but it is because there's only one step that needs to be taken, right? You picking it off the, the, the vine and, and putting it in your mouth as opposed to whatever the heck is needed to get it from where it's grown probably artificially to ending up in the grocery store where you're eating it. So we got to go back to the simplicity and it can be used medicinally, but we, we have a long way to go to get to, I think the, the optimal state of our food supply. I'd agree, but let's play devil's advocate. If people had to find their food or farm their food themselves, at least 90% of the population dies within two years because Absolutely. they can't handle it. And the, the space wise, I mean, New York city would just be, a massive fight of people trying to get to the land. How do we Absolutely. do, how do we do farming, modern farming based off of what we know in a more sustainable way, both for the environment, for humans, but then also it's gotta be economic as well. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, and the point is not to say we have to get to optimal or else you know, nothing works, but we do need to create an, an optimal understanding, right? If we can at least get this, this frame of reference to what is optimal, then we can at least move as close as we can to that, that point, right? Just, and the reason I say that is because people think that they're, if they just go to the store and buy organic food, that that's, then I'm as good as it gets. It's not close, right? So we don't know what, where that food was grown, how it was shipped, what it was washed with, you know, if there's any preservatives or anything used in that process. So, you know, the, the starting point I think is that we just have to get back to growing some, some of our food ourselves and people that in a, in a high rise apartment in New York city say it's impossible. You, you can get a pot, you can put some really good soil in there with all kinds of microorganisms and you can grow some, some basil or some tomatoes or whatever it is, some carrots. You can start at very, very simple places like that to grow your own food. And so just imagine if, half of the population started growing a little bit of their own food, right? What does that do to the whole supply, to the whole, to whole supply chain? It drastically alters it. So you don't have to grow all your food, but if, if a lot of people start growing a little bit of food, that drastically moves us in the right direction. And the people that are able to grow more of their own food in their backyard gardens, in their front yards, whatever it is, then all of a sudden we're shifting in a, in a totally new direction. That I think is sort of the first step is that we have to go back to sort of these, these backyard gardens, right? And as we do that, then new economic streams can come online. We have amazing technology that can connect people peer to peer, right? So eventually, if there's enough of a market for it, and we start moving in this direction enough, you could imagine a scenario where Joe down the street has a huge yard and he's a hell of a green thumb and he, he loves gardening and he's growing all kinds of stuff that he can't even eat. Now he can be a point of, of sale for the local people in the community. This is exactly what we see in, in these blue zone areas. Somebody's growing an abundance of, of one thing or two things and they're trading it or giving it or selling it to others or selling it to the, the local um, gr um, restaurant for use. So we just don't have enough, we haven't decentralized the food supply enough to, for these economic streams to become viable. But you can definitely imagine a scenario, especially with things like Airbnb and, and Uber in place right now, we could easily imagine a scenario where this food system becomes decentralized enough that new streams of, of business can, can come from this that will be much more efficient, much more cost effective, much healthier, and completely destroy these, these, these food giants that are, that are dominating the market right now. But let's say you are growing your own food in, in an apartment or in your house. You're growing maybe one hundredth of one thousandth of a percent of what you'll eat for the year. I, I think the future of food is, is twofold is most likely city-based farms. So having, having what you're eating close to where you're eating it is ideal. And then for larger scale stuff, I think we're moving quite quickly towards a, a clean meat future where we, we lab grow meat just for the, the numerous ethical reasons. Those would probably be larger scale facilities. Yeah, I think, I think you're 100% right on the, on the community farming or community gardening aspect. We're seeing those pop up all over the place. And that's absolutely going to be the case. But again, before that, you know, just 
just from a business standpoint, if we don't have people that understand the value of buying that stuff and understand the, the, the quality difference, then that will be hard pressed to take off in any, in, in most places other than, than these sort of West coast based sort of Portland, Oregon type places that I'm familiar with. Um, we have to build an awareness about the difference between getting your food from a, a community garden that's grown ethically and locally and seasonally compared to what you find at Whole Foods. So we, we have to keep shifting the narrative and, and creating an understanding of, of the difference between the two. When it comes to meat, I am deathly afraid of, of this new meat stuff that we're creating in labs. It is completely against all of biology to create something in a lab like this and have it be successful. So I am, I'm definitely not in favor of that. Um, I, I, I hope that we go back to a more rural form of meat growing and consuming and transporting. Um, cause what we're doing now with the factory farms is absolutely horrendous, uh, both to the animals, to the land and to our health. But I, I definitely do not subscribe to the idea that growing anything in a lab is going to be effective uh, solution for us at any point. And I, I would argue that it would cause more health issues faster to the point where we would reject it so quick. Why do you think that is? I, I think that's pers personally, I think that's kind of dogma, but I'm curious to hear your reasons. Uh, because I'm, I'm a believer in nature. I believe nature figures out the best way to do things. And as we start tweaking and, and modifying things, we lose the essence, the magic that nature has already figured out. We think that things are so mechanical that we can just replicate them and duplicate them in a lab, but it doesn't work that way. Not, all the naturalists uh, have shown this is the case, that we can't sort of play the hand of God and think that there's no unintended consequences because we don't understand all of the, the nuances that go into creating a live organism. Right? We cannot create live organisms other than by birth. This is, that's it. You know, every attempt for us to do this results in crazy genetic modifications that we don't understand yet. So because we don't understand the consequences, I have no doubt that we'll move forward in this. I, I bet you, I would be willing to bet that people are not gonna buy into the scale that it will allow it to move forward. And if they do, it will just result in, in poor health outcomes. So right now, most of the third world doesn't have access to meat and certainly not enough. That's why, that's why they're very deficient. If you look in the past, the reason why Asian cultures are short is they didn't have as much access to meat and protein. Going forward, that's a major problem as these countries become more and more economically successful. But today it's something like 10%, 18% of, of carbon emissions or fossil fuel emissions come from, fa come from farming. I don't think people are going to go forward. They're not going to go full vegan. We've, we've seen that. People, people aren't going to do that. They, they want meat. How do you, there, there's no way to handle meat at a large scale, completely pasteurized system if you have to take into account the demand now, increasing demand, and then all the new countries coming online. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to ask ourselves, what's the, what's the point? What's the goal? You know, if we look at the blue zones, every single person that I talked to that was, over the age of 90, with the exception of one, there was one guy in Costa Rica that was about six feet tall. Every other one of them was about literally from four foot five to about five foot two, probably in that range, maybe even shorter than four foot five. 105 year old Julio, uh, I've got a picture with him. I, I look like an absolute giant. I'm only 5'10, 175 pounds. I look like an absolute different species than this guy. So, you know, to say that we need to be tall or we need to be big. I don't know. What's, what's the point, right? So being short doesn't necessarily equate to anything bad in my mind. Um, 105 year old Julia was riding a bike and he was short as hell and he actually doesn't eat meat. Um, he, he ate meat when his wife, his wife was alive. And then um, as the meat started to change, uh, he's like, I don't even eat it anymore. You couldn't pay me to eat that stuff. So, you know, I, I don't know that meat is a necessity in terms of long, you know, long life or health. Um, I eat meat myself, so I'm not against it. I'm just, I just don't, I just don't know that there's an argument that we need it per se. And if you look at the areas that that the U.S. and, and a lot of these NGOs have have uh, gone into, the health is declining in some of these places, right? So I don't know that we're actually doing much good when we go into these places and and try to supply them with things. Um, you know, I, I think it's a matter, and there's a lot at play in the quote unquote third world, but. 
to say that, that meat is a necessity, I just don't know that that's an accurate statement, especially with the people that I've talked to that may or may not have eaten meat at any given quantity, especially for a number of years where they may not have had hardly any food because there was war and, and armistice and there was the government was sort of rationing food. So I think we look at fasting and intermittent fasting as a, as a tool, as a mechanism for autophagy and, um, and good health and sort of cleaning up the system. So there's a lot to, to look at in that regard, but I don't know that meat is a necessity for us to be healthy. And in fact, if you look at the countries that eat meat versus that, that don't eat meat, there is no correlation to health. Um, there's just humans have been known to eat damn near anything. Uh, and I think really it goes down, goes back to quality food. You know, the, the things that they, the meat that they were eating in Costa Rica was they were eating, uh, lowland paca, the, the, the mountain deer that were near them. They would have uh, usually a pig that they would have on their farm that they would slaughter once a year. Um, so, you know, and then they would eat fish. So uh, this changed depending on where you were and what region of the world, but a lot of the food that they were eating was wild caught, you know, I mean, the, the wild caught fish and the wild caught, uh, the, you know, hunted deer and, and what have you in the paca, totally different than, than raising meat in a, in a lab to solve a quote unquote protein problem or meat problem. So, you know, I just don't know that that's a necessity like we think it is. Crickets. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a cricket eater, but it's totally viable if that's, if that's an option. It seems like that could be a really good way to go because we found soy is not that great for, for human beings, especially males. Having a better protein source would be good. Yeah, I mean, but, but, and this is another, it kind of, I agree with the soy aspect, but at the same time, you look at Okinawa and Japan, they eat tons of soy. And what we look at, when we look at soy, we have to look at the fact that in the past 30 or 40 years in the West, it's, it's been hybridized. It's been, it's GMO soy that's just completely doused with pesticides and herbicides and fungicides and rodenticides. So those things, I think we have to look at, is it organic grown in good soil, soy that is processed in a way that is not going to harm us. And if you look at the soy we've eaten, we've broken every rule. We grow it in poor soil. It's loaded with, with chemicals before we even get it. We process the heck out of it, you know, and, and then we consume it in quantities and in ways that are not necessarily beneficial. So I think there is ways to eat all foods. We just have to recognize how to grow them, how to process them, and how to eat them. Even things like bread. You know, we're seeing so much gluten and bread issues in the West, but they ate tons of bread in, in Italy. Tons of bread. That was the fundamental component to all their meals for the when when these people were growing up. I mean, if you you didn't have a meal without bread. Um, it was laughable. So now now so so we have to look at that and go what, what's what's changed, right? So. And, and then beans, another one, you know, beans are not really thought of as something all that healthy, except for maybe by the vegetarian vegan community here in the West. But I don't see a lot of people looking at beans saying this is a really good food. And yet that was a primary source of food, of uh, protein and fiber in, in Costa Rica, uh, as well as in Italy. Um, so, you know, these things that we think are bad or maybe not aren't as good, I think we just have to go back to how they're grown. Again, it's simplicity. It's following the laws of nature. And if we do these things, then I think we're, we're going to find that we have a lot more source of protein, a source of food than, than we thought, that we don't have to grow these massive wheat fields and soy fields and, you know, all this crap um, that, that we're growing here in the U.S. and cornfields in horrible ways and producing with horrible technologies and processing methods to produce processed chemically laden foods that we then consume and then we blame the corn. So I think we just have to look at all these things in a different way. And this is part of the reason why we made this film is because they completely destroy the dogma, the, this, this thought process that we have in the West, that corn is bad, wheat is bad, uh, beans are bad, cheese is bad, milk is bad, fruit is bad. I mean, it's laughable. Right, pork. Pork is actually a, the one of the only common meats that was eaten in all the all the places we visited. Uh, pork and, and fish really are the two uh, the two common foods, and and nobody do I know is, is spouting the the benefits of pork, and yet these people live to over a hundred, very commonly. So, you know, it's part of the reason why I love these these places is because they sort of destroy the narratives that we're so often told, and if we just look at them in a different way and understand what it is about the way that they live that is different than how we live, then we can separate some of this stuff and, and really figure out what is the, the key thing to focus on. How do you think about food evolution specifically? Not what your far out ancestors ate, but just 
with the generations before you ate. I've seen some pretty compelling theories that say people that eat relatively similar to how their ancestors ate seem to be better adapted to processing those foods and to being healthier while eating them. Yeah, I, I actually don't like and I don't buy into this ancestral argument of sort of the, the more traditional paleo ideas. No, no, not, is, pa- not paleo, not right, paleo. So, right. Yeah, yeah, I'll get to you. But I just want to sort of start there and say that, that I don't believe that we need to go back 10,000 years and say, okay, that's how we, that we ate and we were healthy, therefore we got to go back there. I think that's ridiculous because you actually have healthy people around the world today that don't eat like that. So I do think that there is an evolution of food that we can look at to, to model from. And I do think that eating similar to your ancestry is probably a good idea. Um, and what I mean by that is, and this is hard for us in, in the U.S. because we're so, I mean, we're all mutts, right? We don't have a homogenous sort of lineage like they do in some of these areas. And this actually gets to a lot of the sort of blue zone areas, why they might be so unique in, in, a, in, a, in one regard, which is to say that most of them are islands. Uh, Costa Rica is a little peninsula. But even Michel Poulon, who's the demographer to identify these places, he actually would look for these characteristics in, around the world as a starting point to say, okay, maybe that's the next you know, statistically, statistically significant area that I need to look at. Because the island preserves what? It pre- preserves the lineage, the, the gene, preserves the, the genetic heritage, and it also preserves the culture. So it preserves the, the ways of life that, that they've sort of figured out over generations that would keep that group of people healthy. Right? So if you look at the, the way that they lived in the mountains of Sardinia versus how they live in Okinawa, very, very different foods, very, very different practices, and yet they're both really, really healthy. So they've, they've both figured out ways to create a style of living, a system of living that is beneficial for that sort of genetic lineage, if you will. And there's not a lot of cross-cultural, cross-genetic you know, mixing going on that might disrupt this at the biological level. So this is where it gets complex at the biological level. We have genetic lineage that are sort of somatic cell, right? Our cellular lineage that we think of when we think of our genes. We have that to think about. Then we have our mitochondria, which are organelles that live inside the cell that have their own genome. You know, you got yours from your mother. I got mine from my mother. All, it all passes down through the female line. And that has its own set of genes. So your mitochondrial genes are different than my mitochondrial genes. So we have two sets of genetic lineages living inside one cell right now. Then you think about the microbiota that live in and on us. Most of it's stored in the gut, but it's in the brain, it's in the bloodstream, it's on our skin, it's everywhere, it's in our nose. You have those species of bacteria and viruses and fungi and all yeasts and all these things. They have their own genes, right? Then you throw in the food component. Now the food aspect is feeding and contributing signals, if you will, messages to our various genomes, our mitochondrial genes, our, our somatic cell genes, and the, the, the genes of the, of the biome that lives within us. So it's sort of feeding or communicating to them, but then it also has its own genome, right? If you did an apple, it has its own genes that are talking to our other genomes. So we have so many genomes working in conjunction that it gets really, really messy really, really quick. And if you take somebody like me that has just a ton of North European lineage, but it's all over the map, right? It's, it's, it's everywhere. How do you really sort through that? And I think you just have to figure out something that is sort of in line with the area that you might be more prominently from. So if I'm in Northern European, you know, there's a lot of different food cultures that, that are from there, but we can kind of get a sense of some of the things that they would eat and consume and some of the things they wouldn't, right? Pineapple is probably not a thing that they were eating a lot of in Northern Europe 300 years ago. So I think there's some truth to that, but I also think that that things are so complex now. Um, I'm living in San Diego, which is completely different than my, you know, Northern European heritage. So how do we factor that in too, right? And I'm in inside most of the time as opposed to they were outside most of them. So it just gets messy real quick. So without confusing things too much, I think you just have to go back again. I think the most important thing is to go back and get organic, simple food grown in good soil, hopefully near you, perhaps seasonally eaten in the correct window of time so that you're not eating at 4 a.m. And then also at midnight and all these things, there's a time factor of eating and then how much you're eating. Um, so there's, there's more, I think there's bigger levers to pull if we focus on getting the essence of quality food eaten in the correct daily window 
and not overabundance of anything in particular. I think that is the, the starting point. And then you can start to feel out, yeah, maybe, you know, potatoes and, and, you know, cabbage and, you know, these type of things are more likely to do well with me because I'm Northern European, you know, carrots and some of these type of root vegetables, perhaps that's something to look at. Um, you know, maybe more cheeses and more meats and stews and these type of things in the winter. So I think you can play around with that stuff, but I don't know that that, that is a, the optimal starting point. Again, I think you got to go back to how clean can you get your food and, and from how quality of soil is it coming? And also how is it being processed? I think those are the main starting points. And if you want to simplify all this for future generations, it's time to start inbreeding again, guys. Great news. <laughs> yeah. But uh, in, in all seriousness, um, if you had to give three to five recommendations, things that you saw across the board that were the most beneficial, it can be health, it can be eating, it can be family, social circles, et cetera, what would your recommendations be and why? Um, I would say s- simplify your life and everything that's around you, right? Simplify your your clothes closets, simplify your cleaning products, simplify, just go around your house and simplify. We don't need as many things as we think. Um, that's a very good place to start uh, because we have all this extra sort of mental and emotional baggage that comes with a lot of those things anyway. Um, I would say any, any disrupted relationship you have in your life, whether it's with a boss or a mother or a brother or whatever it is, a wife or a husband, try to rectify those or eliminate those. And a lot of people, you know, don't like this idea of getting rid of relationships, but if, if there's a toxic relationship, even if it sort of goes unsaid or undiscussed, it, it does affect us in a profound way. And I've seen people completely heal from pretty severe chronic issues by fixing a relationship or getting rid of that relationship. So it's very, very powerful. Um, so I would say, see if there's anything big in your life right now that you can focus on to, to remedy that. Uh, another one is sleep. This is where we repair, recover, regenerate, heal is during the sleep process. So make sure that you're sleeping well. And that can be, there's a lot of things that can go into sleep, but I would say fix your lighting environment. That's the number one thing. So go outside in the morning and get light in your eyes. That sets your circadian clock, get your brain operating on the right time of the day, and it will help you fall asleep at night. And then the last part of that is to uh, reduce any artificial lighting at night such that you can get it as dark as possible. You can use orange light bulbs. You can use um, orange glasses to protect against sort of the blue blue light at night. Those are the, probably the two components for sleep that I would recommend. Blue uh, filters on your blue filter apps on your phone and laptop as well. Computer. Computer. Yep. Yes. Yep. Huge. Yeah. And especially if you're on them a lot, right? It just saves your eyes uh, long term. So I think that's important. Um, I think get outside. Um, get outside and get in touch with the earth. So whether it be barefoot or you know, what have you, gardening or any of those things, going to the beach, I have a beach right here. It's something that I love that I have access to. Just getting outside into nature. We know that even going, uh, looking at a picture of nature, so it can be a painting of nature, a photo of nature in your house, changes the, the way your brain operates. It changes the, the brainwave state. So going out into nature, in, in you know, Japan they call it Shinrin Roku, which is you just getting outside, forest bathing. So that's just a big one, I think, for us now in our modern world because we're stuck inside so much. Is just to get outside as much as you can, whether it's hot, cold, or rainy, just get out there and get in touch with the earth again. It will shift your anxiety, your depression, any of these sort of racing thoughts, calm you down. It's, it's very, very powerful. Um, and I think the last one is um, that we haven't touched on maybe is, is to focus on water getting good, clean water. Uh, this can be a hard one for a lot of people, especially if they're living in a city. Uh, but know that the public water supply in most places is worse than you think. Um, there are pharmaceutical drug residues and metabolites in these waters. There are uh, chemicals. Uh, there are metals. There's, there's all kinds of crap in these waters. And it's really, really detrimental to your health, especially long term. Um, and it, I used to work in the engineering field and we used to actually go to wastewater treatment plants to help them be more efficient. And so I've seen the processes that these wastewater treatment plants go through and I've seen what they do and they don't get rid of most of the things that we want them to get rid of. Um, so I, th- I think finding a good clean source of water, hopefully spring water, um, drinking out of glass water bottles, these type of things is very, very important uh, over the long haul. Grab a filter for your sink as well. Never Absolutely. Hurts. Yes. I think that's super helpful. What technology are you most excited about? Huh? Good question. I would say there's a lot I'm excited about, honestly. Um, 
I like the idea of self-driving cars. I think that's going to be a game changer in a lot of ways. I think that'd be really cool. Um, I don't think of the Uber, I don't think that's going to, I don't think in the Uber sense, but I think that there's a possibility that that can radically shift how we operate in cities. Um, down the line, I don't think a self-driving car in and of itself is that remarkable, except to say that as we start to develop ideas around it, I think that could be really cool. Um, I like a lot of the, the tracking devices that we have that can track biomarkers um, for us. You know, we have some of these sleep trackers now, which are very beneficial and heart rate variability and these type of things. But I think this idea of collecting, you know, biological data and using this sort of big data analysis and technology that are coming with it, I think can be a very valuable tool to just give us a sense of what we're doing and how it's affecting us in, in, in various ways. So I don't like the idea of technology changing or altering us necessarily. I like it to track so that we can see what's happening. If I do this, then this happens. If I do that, then that happens. I think that's going to be a really cool uh, advancement as we go as the technology gets infinitely smaller and smarter um, to sort of track what we're doing. There's a lot of interesting things coming, especially on the health front. It's crazy. It's, it's exciting. And, and this is why I think we have to have the philosophy. We got to get this philosophy right about what health is and where it comes from. Because if we do, then we can use these things effectively and very, very smartly. But if we don't, then we, we could really just jump off a cliff with some of these things. I see improvement at the top levels where people realize that health, wellness are important for performance, health, and mental, mental clarity. But I would say 90s, 2000s, and even up till today, you see people that are running super successful banks and then the next day they jump off a cliff. Exactly. Yeah. And, th and this is, this gets to the core problem I think that our society is setting up is that we're not really in touch with what we really want and what we're, what we're, what society is supposed to develop for us. Like why are we creating societies? You know what I mean? There's, there's places around the world that have much higher happiness indexes than we do that are much, you, you can call them second or third world countries. You know, you go to Costa Rica um, in some of these villages, I mean, they look drab and terrible and yet you spend some time there and you're, you're just beyond happy because you have everything you need and you're operating in a way that is just more conducive to, to being happy. So yeah, I think you're right. I think we're, we're, there's a lot of things that we're doing that aren't necessarily in alignment with who we are as individuals and as a society. So I think if we can get back in touch with that a little bit, then we don't have to be afraid of technology or afraid of progress. I think this is fine. We just have to have a better direction. And to think about it consciously. I think that's a big, a big part Absolutely. of it. Jason, Absolutely. where's the best place for people to find you and learn more about what you do? Uh, they can go to humanlongevityfilm.com. Um, if they enter that email address, they'll get episode one of the series for free. We'll just mail that right to them. Um, and then they can find me on social media on Facebook. I'm just at Jason Prawl or the Human Longevity Project uh, as well. So Human Longevity, how long do you think you'll make it? You know, it's funny. I don't really care. <laughs> um, my, my goal is to be happy every single day. So if I can accumulate a lot of happy days and being in the moment, then that's really my goal. Um, you know, I think if I live to 150 and I hate my life the whole way, I think what's the, what's the point of that? So I just want to be happy and enjoy the moment and, and live each day as, as much as I can and hopefully accumulate as much of those as I can. That's great feedback, especially for people listening to this. There's a lot of high performers and occasionally it takes some, it, it's pretty valuable to see what you want and just what, what you need to be happy. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks for coming today, Jason. Hope you guys have liked this. It's been a, it's been a fun one for me. And uh, until next time, you know where to find us. Again, disruptors.fm. We switch in the branding, guys. It was Fringe FM until we found out there were some crazy UFO chasers there and we were getting some negative, negative press and reactions on that. So disruptors.fm. Welcome to the Disruptors podcast where we get the most awesome folks. Cheers.